Hey there. So recently I cycled from Pacifica, California to Moss Landing, California, taking video along the way, uh, making comments about my observations, uh, particularly of, of uh, birds uh, and some plants and a few other things. I uh, set up camp uh, underneath some cypress trees uh, in a, f a farmer's field adjacent to uh, the sea, adjacent to Año Nuevo National Park. And I, uh, turns out, well, I, I got, I heard the calls uh, of uh, at least one individual, one uh, great horned owl, Buo virginianus, uh, and I even got to see it and um, collected what I think are some of his owl pellets. Here is one of them. Just in general, I, I did a lot of research, or I don't know, 10, 10 or so hours of research, uh, reading papers about Bubo Wurginianus. Um, I've learned a lot. <laughs> of course, you know, uh, there's a lot more to be learned. So in this video, I'd like to uh, discuss some of the general facts I learned about Bubo Wurginianus, uh, the great horned owl, in particular, you know, with particular attention to uh, the way it, it, it calls. Uh, I'd also like to play for you uh, some of the audio I've collected and make some observations about the audio that I have uh, of the individual that I recorded. All the uh, research I've done, the, the citations of the papers I've read will be linked in the video. Okay, first of all, let's talk about Bubo wirginianus. Bubo, that's the genus, wirginianus the species, it's the great horned owl or the horned owl, the American horned owl. Uh, it has a massive range from somewhere northern Alaska all the way down to southern Brazil, uh, 68 degrees north to about 54 degrees south. I got that information from a website called animaldiversity.org, which I invite you to go check out. The owls belong to the group Bubo. Uh, in the name itself comes from Latin, uh, which comes from Greek for the European uh, member of the family uh, of the genus, Bubo Bubo that gave us the name, etc. Uh, typically, they're horned owls. They have some feather tufts up here, um, and they enjoy worldwide distribution everywhere but Antarctica. Concerning uh, our American friend, Bubo Wurginianus, or pan-American friend, Bubo Wurginianus, it is sexually dimorphic, uh, meaning the males and females are, are different, at least they are different to us as humans, and in particular, they're different in two ways. One, there are different sizes. The females are larger. Uh, and two, well, obviously, if you dissect them, you have different organs. You know, one produces eggs, one doesn't. Um, however, they're also different in terms of the calls. And um, in, reading the, in reading what I read, uh, about a hundred years or so of research, uh, it's interesting to find out that this was not always uh, obvious to people. Not, not all researchers can tell the difference between uh, male and female um, members of this, of this species. While the uh, female is larger, its syrinx, uh, the noise producing equivalent of our larynx, larynx up here, syrinx down here, the syrinx of the female is smaller. Therefore, her, her, uh, her calls are of a higher pitch than the males, despite the fact that he's in size smaller. Uh, you'll find that interesting, of course, if, you're interested, if, if you know a little bit about uh, sexual dimorphism and how the size of animals relate to uh, the, 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 the fundamental frequency of their calls. According to Norberg 2002, uh, Bubo Bubo, the European namesake, you know, for the genus, uh, does display uh, ear asymmetries in terms of size of the ear and also location of the ear, which is what, you, which is what you'd expect, right? Uh, I think it's common knowledge now in 2021 that uh, owls have asymmetries in their ear, which help them do their, well, owling, detecting of things in the night. Um, however, in 2002, Norberg didn't find any research showing that this was the case for the Great Horned Owl. Kinsler, 2007, uh, she uh, does a literature re review um, of what's known about Bubo Wurginianus calls, and she puts in her own uh, observations. She lives with a, a female Great Horned Owl known uh, with the name of Alice, a rescue bird, and, and in her paper she makes reference to, I think, five other individuals uh, some wild, some um, also in captivity. She establishes uh, f uh, one, two, three, f uh, five ways of phonation. Uh, three of them that use the uh, larynx, sorry, the syrinx, one of which doesn't use the syrinx but does still use lung pressure, and finally, build clacking. 
she lists these as um, hoots, chitters, squawks, and hissing. The hoots, chitters, and squawks being produced in the syrinx, hissing being uh, super syringeal, uh, and then the chatter of the bill, of course, chatter of the bill. Um, for each, for for each of these, for three of these phonation types, in particular, for the hoots, chitters, and squawks, she identifies social uh, different ways of, of phonating, uh, different subregimes for each one of these regimes, um, and gives them labels depending on uh, that have to do with the, the the social use, which she believes is the social purpose of the call, um, uh, or. Uh, uh, the emotional state that uh, the bird seems to be communicating. Uh, so, for example, as far as the hoot is concerned, <laughs> she lists territorial hoot, greeting hoot, emphatic hoot, staccato hoot, and wild hoot, um, uh, providing actually uh, spectrograms for all of these uh, for the individuals, not a, a large number of spectrograms, but uh, spectrograms nonetheless. You gotta read this paper. It's a very interesting paper. It's a very interesting paper. Uh, um, the territorial hoot is the one I think we're all uh, uh, accustomed to hear. Uh, the one we associate with the bird. So <laughs> you should read the paper. I'll link it down below. It's very, very good. I, there's a couple of men things I want to mention about it, however. Uh, concerning the staccato hoot, uh, Kinsler says, this hoot is given when excited, usually when birds of a mated pair are together and may often precede copulation. So watch out for that staccato hoot. Uh, another interesting thing uh, in the Kinsler paper is that uh, she, as she's reviewing other papers, she mentions that some of these um, researchers were unable to determine the sex of the bird based on the call, uh, and she can. So uh, I read a paper, Martinez and Supergoitia, 2002. Uh, they did some experimental work with Bubo Bubo in Europe, in Spain. From this paper, I learned that in these birds, in this uh, close cousin of our of our bubo with Guineanus, uh, the males and the females call, call cooperatively during the breeding season. The point of the paper was to establish whether or not you could identify the number of uh, individuals in a territory by using a playback method, where you, uh, bird watchers used to do this a lot. Uh, you have a recording of, say, a male, and you play it out loud, and you see who calls back. Uh, in that research, they found that buba buba who are unmated, they're called floaters, do not call back. Uh, so, you know, if you're doing a population sampling using the technique of playing a recorder, what would you get called back? In the case of buba buba, you get females and males calling back as long as they're mated. But if they're not mated, they won't call back. The paper that I found most interesting, or that sent me to uh, look at different websites and read different papers to understand it better, uh, was the Odom et al. 2013 paper titled Distinctiveness in the Territorial Calls of Great Horned Owls Within and Among Years. Very interesting paper. They did this in California. They uh, recorded the, the calls of uh, several individuals, males and females, over the course of many years uh, and noted the location. Uh, they, they had the location information. They recorded the calls. And then they categorize the calls with a featural system. We'll, we'll, we'll talk more about the featural system when we look at the spectrograms of the, my recordings. But essentially, they're looking at each syllable of the call, space between the syllables, the loudness of the syllable, frequency features of each syllable. And they did some uh, statistical analyses, particularly MANOVAs and distinctive feature analyses, to try to tease out a couple of things. For example, how can you detect individuals? Uh, what features are most uh, uh, significant when detecting individuals? And do uh, uh, individual songs change over the course of time? But ultimately, they just what they did is they compared uh, uh, the calls of animals, the calls that they were dead sure belonged to one individual against each other, and then compared those against all others and figured out what features are best for predicting uh, individuality. And they, did, they conducted those same studies across time and where things fell out, where, where, where individuals dropped off in predictability, you could state, okay, this male moved. This is a new male in the same spot as before. And so you can make, draw some inferences about how males move around and how territories are seeded and gained. Uh, Kramen and Sidis, 2013, Foundations of Voice Studies. And uh, I, I went to that paper 
while reading this paper, that paper, that book, and uh, read chapter five about identifying individuals, what's known from the animal world and what's known from humans. The main conclusion or the main point that uh, Kramer and Sidness drive home throughout the chapter and throughout the book is the gestalt-like properties of human communication. We identify individuals. Uh, none of the features that we use when we study human voice, none of the features that we use in isolation is good enough to really uh, help us predict how humans identify individuals. It's not fundamental frequency. It's not necessarily shimmer and jitter uh, or uh, what is it, HNR. There are somehow, what, whatever it is that you are doing, you do when you identify George Clooney, from your, you know, just from his voice, uh, is complex. Uh, we do build machines that identify humans, uh, and in these animal research, uh, it is shown that you can use certain feature systems to identify individuals, or, and maybe the animals use those things themselves. However it is that Bubo is identifying individuals, uh, or not identifying individuals, we have to ask ourselves, well, are they doing this, right? <laughs> I mean, we're, we, can identify, we can identify individuals. Is this by chance, you know, the way you can detect a cloud is a storm cloud and you know it's going to rain, but the cloud didn't mean to tell you that. Maybe Bubo doesn't care about individuals. Uh, of course, Bubo protects territories. Uh, uh, Bubo Ruginianos protects territories and they select mates. Uh, and the mates engage in uh, seasonal uh, territory defense, cooperative territory defense. And that's true of Bubo Bubo and Bubo Ruginianos. So that leads me to believe that, yes, they identify individuals in order to protect the territory. If you have a mate, you have to make sure, you know, to identify the mate and not kill your mate and kill, you know, other, other, other invaders. It depends on how you're mating. Is there extra pair mating in Bubo? You know, maybe, maybe, maybe our friend Bubo has got Penelope and Circe and Calypso and Calidice and Equipe, Equipe and, you know, some other uh, lady lying around, uh, you know. And sure, Penelope's at home and she's the most important one, but there's several others, and you gotta be able to identify all those. I read another interesting paper, uh, Rohner 1997, uh, that studies, um, they did a, they put uh, radio transmitters on these birds, really heavy ones. This is back in 97, okay, they're like 50 grams each. These birds weigh about uh, 1,400 grams, okay, so we're talking uh, like uh, two and a half, three percent of the body weight <laughs> put on these birds. And they did this study where they banded uh, fledglings and then you monitored them over time, over five years. I think it was 88 to 87 to 92, 88 to 93, something like that. And um, they uh, identified the floaters again. The floaters mentioned in the earlier Spanish study for Bubo Bubo. There's these floater males. So some males, they fledge. The next year, they actually pair up and they have nesting sites and all that. And they, you know, they raise chicks. Um, but there's floaters, males and females, that are floater to move around, and uh, they're not nomads. It turns out they have larger ter territories on average, five times larger than a mated, settled pair, or individual. Uh, and in fact, their territories do roughly follow the rough shape of the settled ones. So they, the floater, floater, uh, Bubo Wiginianus seem to avoid, to some extent, the territories of established mating pairs. However, interestingly, not, not exclusively, they do go in to those territories, to the established territories, I guess, the forage. Uh, that or they can't detect them. Don't know. In fact, Rohner in 1997 does mention they found four dead uh, owls, killed by other owls. They, they identified four owls that were killed by other owls, conspecifics. Uh, and in fact, even had visual evidence of one, one of the one of the kills. The paper found no evidence for social behavior of non-pairing floaters, one. And two, they're not vagrants. They do, in fact, hold territories, though they may be much larger than the mated pairs. Uh, they do hold territories. They don't just wander off and disappear. They, they do hold ground, uh, even though they're not established uh, and mated. There are some linguistic or philosophical things to consider. Well, what is a territorial call? So if we assume that there's the, that these animals have the ability to recognize one or more individuals, in identifying the individuals or in making the territorial calls, what are you saying? Are you saying your name? What does it mean? See, if you can identify an individual, you're 
placing a unique label on something. Well, that's what a name is. That's a noun. If you... When you call on a, on a, on a VHF radio on a boat, the first thing you say is who you're trying to address. The second thing you say is who you are. Um, in this case, should we assume that the owls are saying their name? Thus, like their banner, proclaiming their space? Uh, or are they saying something like, is anybody out there? Watch out. There's a subtle difference in stating your name and saying, is there anybody out there? Watch out. Now, it could be the same thing, right? Is anybody out there? And watch out could be conflated into one thing, uh, and that is your name. And maybe because you carry features about your name, features about who you are in your name, you're saying the watch out part uh, by just even stating your name. Uh, notice that the floaters seem to not call much at all. They're not stating their names at all. They, they have no name, right? Uh, Nomen uh, sta- you know, took my eye out. Nomen Blydenby. In the duet calling between mated pairs, what does it mean for, a, for, for them to state the territorial calls together? Um, is there a feature to territorial calls uh, that is different, that is unique when mated, that, that becomes different when males are calling for females in a different season. So a lot of questions that can be asked here uh, surrounding or having to do with the idea of what is a name and what does it mean to advertise yourself in the world. This recording, as you can see, uh, I think is about five minutes long, or whatever 252 seconds is. And in this period of time, uh, roughly from here to here, uh, whatever that is, it called six times, as you can see. Let's look at one of these calls to, to see what the structure of the call is, and we'll reference some of the papers that we read. What I was looking for. So birds have very high-pitched voices. I'm going to go to 30,000 here, show you some interesting things. Now you can see this thing cuts off here. The microphone detects things only up to 20,000 hertz. So even though there could be a lot of sound here, and I'm sure there is, from this bird here, I can't see it because I didn't record it. Just to give you an idea what the background noise here is, uh, I believe these are uh, song sparrows and white crown sparrows. Although those may be bush tits. I didn't see them. It was dark. But you can see most of the energy for these birds um, is in frequencies above 5,000 hertz. And I was, I was having trouble identifying the owl in here. And then it occurred to me, oh, the owl's call is very, very low pitched. It's not this stuff up here that makes the owl the owl. In fact, it's the stuff way below. We're going to go back to 1500 hertz, uh, cut it off at 1500. That's the owl right there. Based on my research, this is a female. The uh, Odom study called this S1 and S2. Short one, short two, long, 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 long. Four longs and two shorts. They defined this as a pinch, as the um, each one of these is a syllable because of the re- reduction in uh, frequency here, the near, near cutoff of vibration. Um, the Kinsler paper did the opposite. They would have treated this as one, two, three, four, five calls. Uh, Whereas uh, Odom treats this as six and believes uh, they would say this is a female. Uh, I have no way of knowing, but if I trust them, then this was a female that I saw. I tabulated the numbers here for each one of the calls. This is the call duration, uh, and this is the silence since the last call. This is the silence since I started recording it. I started recording after the second call, I believe. I was scrambling to find a way to record it without scaring the bird away. Uh, the hoot number does not change. So the number the number of syllables does not change, also known as notes. And as you can see here, this is fairly consistent. The average is 28 seconds between calls with a variation, standard deviation of 5.2 seconds. This enjoys a much, 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 much smaller standard deviation, as you can see. These are very, very tight. The, the duration of the calls. Uh, they're fairly consistent. What Odom measures is 
the duration of each one of these little segments here. For example, this segment lasts about 0.144 seconds. Uh, they also measure the frequency at which it occurs, 360 hertz, uh, and the the maximum amplitude of this thing, you know, how, what, what the maximum loudness is of this object. So maximum loudness of an object, the frequency of the object, the fundamental frequency of the object, the duration of the object, the time since the last object, uh, yeah, that's what they measure. And they found that uh, for males and females, the time between these two is predictive. They also found S1 and L2 among females is the S2 L1 distance and L1 and L2 durations, as well as the number of notes per call, call duration, minimum and maximum number of frequencies of L2. Okay, so they looked at this. Here's here's L1, here's L2, minimum and maximum of these. No, minimum here and maximum here. Those for them are the features that allow them to best predict individuality in these species. So in theory, I have enough information here to identify this one individual. I've got six calls. Uh, they did five to 12 calls per individual. No, an average of 10. Uh, and so, you know, maybe I could identify this bird again. It's interesting to note what the fundamental frequency of this bird's call is. Let's go to call, any call. Let's go to call four here. Where's call? What calls do we have here? Here's call six. Let's play call six. Now, do you think of that as high-pitched or low-pitched? I bet most of you would say that's low-pitched. But in fact... If we look at the fundamental frequency of this call right here, okay, that is 369 hertz. That's like down here. That's uh, F4 uh, on my recorder. Here is A440. Do you guys know Jennifer Tilly? Check this out. Keep calling, keep calling, little heart. Keep calling, keep calling, little heart. You know Jennifer Tilly. Let's check out her fundamental frequency. Uh, it is 348 hertz. Basically, the owl and Jennifer Tilly have the same fundamental keep frequency. Keep calling, keep calling, little heart. Keep calling, keep calling, little heart. Very interesting. What you perceive as high pitched in. In, in Miss Tilly, you think of low-pitched in the owl. How about that for perception studies? Very, very interesting. Let me close this. Here's Miss Tilly again. Dog blood makes noise, and I do. I hear it, like, coursing through my veins. Oh, and, you do? And I hear my heart pounding. I'm like, keep going, keep going, little... Jennifer Tilly, that owl, and the F just below middle A, A440, have roughly the same frequency. Very interesting. Here is the recorder again. Here's A440. And here is the F below that. And there you have it. 343 hertz for the fundamental frequency. If we're correct, if I'm correct, this is a female. I guess that means that females protect territories when they're single, because I didn't hear any on males. But this was not done part of a duet. So maybe this is a male that has an S2. Uh, the second short syllable is considered S2. And indeed, the literature does say that some males do have, a, uh, do have an S2. Now, I don't believe that was mating. this is mating season either. But that's one of the questions I need to find out. Is December in California mating season for these birds? There's a couple of pieces of information that I was not able to find. Uh, even, uh, not only not find papers that I could read, you know, freely available papers, but very few references or no reference to a couple of topics. One of them is the shape of the syrinx of uh, owls. As you know, owls, uh, birds, have a, a, a phonation instrument 
uh, device, tool, tissues that are different from, from basically every other mammal, uh, reptile uh, on the planet, we, have, we use our larynx to communicate, uh, what I'm doing right now, uh, and the uh, and birds use the syrinx, uh, which uh, depending on what family or when the bird evolved or what family belongs to, can be uh, incredibly complex. Uh, one of the papers I read about, uh, re I read, uh, studied the evolutionary advantages of, of the syrinx in its simplest form. At any rate, I can't find any research on what the syrinx of the uh, Buo Reginianos looks like. Now, ornithologists are often butchers. They have no problem chopping up these birds. So I'm very surprised not to find out, to find out that no one seems to have chopped these birds up and studied, this, studied the, the shape of the owl syrinx. Um, they have for many other birds. Another piece of information I was not able to find out has more to do with the owl pellets, and that has to do with the uh, the the prey that they take in this habitat. There's plenty of information about the prey they take in Brazil and Oklahoma, or parts of Brazil and Oklahoma, but how about other habitats? Uh, don't know anything about that. Future directions for research. <sighs> I came up with 11 questions, roughly, uh, that I'd like to uh, learn more about. As we talked about, the number of syllables or notes in a call is one of the features that is distinctive between males and females, uh, I think nearly always. How does that arise? You know, if you're gonna, in your least generous interpretation of these animals, that they're automatons, uh, purely controlled by their genes, how does that arise? Why did that arise? Why would females have more? Does that reflect their size? Okay, uh, clearly this is the question we've talked about so many times. Can they recognize more than one individual, more than their mate? Uh, can they tell the difference between one or another or a third uh, individual? Can they recognize their own adult offspring? Would they be as cruel to their own adult offspring that stayed in their territory or they caught in their territory uh, as they would be to, say, a, a genetically distant stranger? Does that fade with time? How do owls detect the presence of other owls? So in the uh, Roner 1997 paper, we uh, saw that uh, owls kill each other uh, under certain circumstances. How did they find each other? Was it during mating that they found each other and fought to the death? I don't remember reading that. Uh, or did they kill floaters? Did some territory controller kill a floater? Or did a floater kill somebody who controlled the territory? How, if one of them is not calling, how did the territory holder find the floater or vice versa, right? Uh, there's a risk with advertising yourself because it also says, you know, I'm not as big as I think I am. Come kill me. Like a chihuahua barking at wolves. Um, how do you measure territory? So does the owl stand in one point in space, radiate a call, and the boundaries of that is the territory? Or does the owl move around? demarcating a territory larger than any one of its calls could, could cover. Uh, if so, how do owls remember the territory? So if you, you, you know, it's, it, it, imagine that you're sailing and there's a beacon for some object and it's there for a couple of seconds and it's gone. You can see it 10 miles away. When you're, when you're one mile away, it's still gone. How are you going to know to avoid the point? The, the message has to be consistent. So since the message isn't consistent, does that not suggest that animals can recognize individuals and are aware of topography or geography? If that's the case, then therefore, therefore owls are making a connection between topographical markers, geography, and a name. <laughs> Somehow, territory holders can name geographic areas. I mean, that just stands to reason. These owls uh, uh, are known to return to kills several times when they're large to keep feeding. Uh, and obviously there are places that are better for feeding than they're not. They return to the same perch to regurgitate. This I found myself. So they obviously recognize topography. They, recognize, they have maps in their minds. And if they have territories that are larger than one call length and they're not phonating consistently, I guess they have little name tags on topography. How does that work? What does the sexual dimorphism of Bubo Wigianus, uh, wherein the female is larger, say about sexual selection? What is their sexual selection system? How do they pair off? Is it like the northern jacana 
Oh, sorry, the Waddle Jakanda? Uh, or is it, say, like, penguins uh, of some sort? Emperor penguins? Uh, or is it, like, I don't know, oven birds, where they're not cooperative at all, right? Why is the female... Is it the, the fact that the female is larger says what about the way they share the parental load? If Bubu Wadiginianos has asymmetry in the placement of ears and the size of the ears and feathers and skin flaps and all the things that make the heads of owls asymmetric for perceiving objects in the dark, uh, how does this affect the way that their territorial call system works? Does the difference in the ears allow them to do things or force them to do things with their syrinx that other animals that don't have that difference do not do? Finally, they live in vast geographic ranges. Uh, we talked about it earlier, um, uh, over 100 degrees of latitude. How does this affect the way they call? Is the call of the... What are the differences? If you can establish some state for, say, California owls or Northern California owls, is that true of Southern California owls? Is that true of Mexican owls? How about Chilean owls? How does this vary? It's a lot of questions to ask. I hope you enjoyed this video. Uh, I hope you learned a little bit something about uh, Great Horned Owl, um, its phonation, uh, and things like that. I hope to learn a lot more about them too. See you next time. Bye-bye. I do want to let you know that, uh, once again, all the papers I read uh, are going to be linked in the article. And there's also a link for the audio files, uh, the recordings of the bird that I found. Uh, there's links for the raw audio that you can use on any kind of player. And, of course, uh, a uh, collection, a Prat collection, that you can use to study these uh, using Prat, if you know what that is. Um, the uh, phonology, the audiology software, phonetic software, Prat.